achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Who Scott Johnson. On this episode of the show, we are breaking down the upcoming UFC on Fox 22 event, which will take place on December 17th from the Golden One Center in Sacramento, California. I'll be giving you my four main card predictions for the card. All of my preliminary picks, nine in total, will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net, where you can cruise by and check them out throughout the week. Additionally, my fight packs will be for sale in the bet shop for 12 bucks. You get full breakdowns of each and every single fight, betting and fantasy previews for all, along with DraftKings lineups, which have done very well the last couple of shows. I have parlay setups for both individuals who have massive bank rolls and want to be more conservative and still make some money. And it's people who just want to have a little more fun, invest a small amount, have a shot to win a large amount, but they have realistic expectations of the fact that, you know, with higher rewards comes much higher risk. So check those out. Plus, I give all kinds of props counter bets on fighters who I think who I didn't pick but I think are still valid investments there's a number of things I provide and you can check all that for just 12 bucks uh, we're coming off a pretty you know a, a not a terrible weekend I think I went overall was it 14 and 10 not not, not on earth you know not a fan I lost three split decisions though which really was difficult all three split decisions I lost I had a couple nice upsets over the weekend uh, a couple nice a number of solid prop picks including picking Cerrone to win by knockout uh olivier obam or ca to win by submission i also picks Mac, picks picked the max hallway pettis fight not to go the distance so those are all solid victories the gas love set was also quite nice so yeah lots to build on and again it's always difficult to do to put as much work as i do into predicting fights when there are two events back to back but with this show we will certainly have the opportunity to sit down and really analyze each fight meticulously and hopefully come out with some solid picks on that note let's get to that first pick on the main card. We are going to kick things off in the UFC's welterweight division as Alan Brahma Joban, 14 wins and 4 losses, takes on Platinum Mike Perry, undefeated with 9 victories. And Perry has picked up back to back knockout victories since coming to the UFC, and he has fought three times. This is his third fight in five months with the promotion, so certainly an active fighter. And when he's winning and having success, why not? Uh, for Joe Ban, he's coming off a pretty solid win over Bilal Muhammad. He has won two in a row and four of his last five. His only loss during that current span was a knockout loss against Albert Tumenov. Physically, Joe Ban's two inches taller of a two-inch reach advantage, but Mike Perry is 10 years younger than Brahma. Now, looking at Platinum Mike first, he has nine pro victories. That's it, but all of them have ended... Uh, sorry, his nine pro fights, that's all. And all of them have ended by knockout six in the first round, uh, but of his last five fights, just two have wrapped up inside the first five minutes. So obviously an increase in competition has resulted in uh, you know prolonged fight times for Perry. For Joe Ban, he has 18 career fights, so double the experience of Perry. Nine wins by knockout, two losses by knockout as well. One submission win, four and two on the scorecards. Now looking at Perry first, he has very big power. He hits exceptionally hard with everything he throws. He tends to throw a lot of single strikes. He'll you know work behind a left jab, and he'll mix in some hard low kicks periodically throughout the fight. He does a nice job of keeping pressure on, but he does have a tendency to leave his hands low because he's simply not afraid to get hit. He has a, you know confidence in his chin that it will hold up, and, to, and so far it has. Now he does like to try and bait his opponents in with those hands down to invite him to attack and then throw counter strikes. When they do come forward, which is, you know, it, it's it's working for him so well. Uh, when he fought uh, Gyun Hu Lim in his debut, he dropped him with a massive counter left. He also picked up a huge right hand, connected with a huge right hand to put him down as well. He landed that right hand as well against Danny Robertson. His last fight didn't, you know, to hurt him. Uh, mixed in some hard kicks and knees as well in the clinch in that fight. And really did a good job overall beating a pair of pretty dangerous and pretty capable strikers. Now, in the last fight, which was pretty grueling, went into the third round, he was slowing down a bit. He was getting hit, he cracked hard with some big shots from his opponent. Uh, he was getting his lead leg chewed up a little bit as well. And again, hands down, inviting guys in. That eventually worked out for him, but still it's a strategy you wonder how long he can play with as the quality of opposition goes up. Will that eventually catch up with him? Now for Joe Ban, he also has power. He does his best work at close range. He took out Richard Walsh uh, with elbows in tight. He landed a nice head kick in close against Brennan O'Reilly when he knocked him out. He is a capable distance striker, but he doesn't seem nearly as comfortable on the outside. And he tends to wait on his opponent a little bit and let them push the pace while looking for his spots when he's on the outside. Now, he did drop Muhammad with a big left hand, and he put him down with a head kick as well. And he had a couple of knockdowns in that fight. So certainly he can, he knows how to put guys on their uh, the seat of their pants. Now, when he fought two men off and lost that matchup, 
He was tagged early on and was pressured, had a lot of trouble backing the Russian off and getting some respect with the striking and ultimately got knocked out. Now, his chin is a bit of a question mark. Seth Pazinski in his debut, which I correctly predicted as an upset victory for him, uh, he was hurt by Pazinski early on. Uh, Worley Alves hurt him. Gordy Dwyer hurt him. And, of course, two men, has, two men have knocked him, out, or knocked him out, which was the second knockout of his career. So certainly his chin, bit of a concern. And against Mike Perry, you have to take that into account. Now, takedowns haven't been a major issue for Joe Ban in his UFC career. No one's really pushed that. We saw Worley Alves have some success there. But that's very opts to go with his wrestling. In this matchup, you know, Joe Ban's need to close the distance to get into a comfortable striking range is going to put him directly in his opponent's danger zone, where Perry can unload with those counter strikes and really go to work on that questionable chin. I think the lack of distance output for Joe Ban is going to allow Perry, when he wants to close the distance and fire off those big single strikes with really without much defense, you know, ultimately this comes down to the battle of the chins. Uh, and I certainly favor Mike Perry. He, I expect him to land that big counter left hand versus Joe Ban when he tries to come in and attack and take advantage of his... See Perry hurt Joe Ban, drop him a couple of times, you know, bang him up, but eventually he's going to get the finish. So my prediction is Mike Perry to defeat Alan Joe Ban by knockout. The next fight on the main card will be the final fight in the career of an MMA legend as the seventh ranked fighter in the Bantamweight division and the former WEC featherweight champion, the California kid Uriah Faber, 33 wins and 10 losses, takes on England's own Brad One Punch Pickett with a current record of 26 wins and 12 defeats. Now, this is Faber's retirement fight. Keep in mind, Brad Pickett also is getting exceptionally close to the end of his career. He's actually a year older than Faber, and he's kind of hinted at it as well. I would almost think this could be the end of his career if he knew he didn't want to take, you know, walk away at the same time and maybe diminish or take away from Faber's retirement. But Pickett, you know, he's probably going 2017. I can't imagine will be won't be the last year of his career, but I could be wrong. Now, Faber comes in this matchup having lost back-to-back -back fights and just a single win in his last four matchups. Ultimately, the loss to Rivera was certainly a passing of the guard from the old standard to the new up-and-coming fighter, and that was a good fight, good win by, by Rivera overall. Uh, Faber is going to finish his, his UFC career with a 9-2 record, either, oh, sorry, either 10-2 or 9-3 record, depending on the outcome of this matchup, in non-title fights. Unfortunately, in UFC title fights, he is 0-4 and has actually lost his last seven uh, fights with a gold strap on the line, dating back to his WEC day. So certainly a bit of a rough run there, but overall favors career. The guy's a legend. Um, when you look at Brad Pickett, he's coming in off a submission loss to Yuri Alcantara. He was knocked out by uh, Almeida one fight prior to that. He only has one win in his last five fights, which was a very contentious split decision victory over Francisco Rivera. Basically, both guys five foot six, one inch reach advantage for the Brit. Faber is the younger man, as I mentioned, by a single year. Now, looking at Faber's numbers, he is 19 and 0 in fights ended by submission. That is impressive. A 20th victory would be a great way to cap off a great career. Unfortunately, Faber six and seven on the scorecards, and a lot of those losses coming against elite competition. And overall, his style really does not equate to decision victories, especially when you're facing guys who have the ability to match what you you offer. When you look at his stats, he has an even strikes absorbed per minute and strikes landed per minute with Mark, so it's very difficult to distance himself on the feet, at least win a decision with that alone. He averages just 1.44 takedowns at a 29% completion rate. Again, not impressive numbers. Not elite numbers, despite the fact he is an elite fighter, or at least was at his prime. Ultimately, with Faber, he only needs one takedown to put his opponent on the mat and either set up a submission or keep them there and do some damage and win the round. And that's why his numbers are so low because he just keeps going for it, eventually gets it, and that's all he takes. If he doesn't get it, well, he's in trouble. Once on top, he's a smothering top game. Excellent ground and pound from the guard. He's always looking to set up for opportunities to set up that submission. He has nine victories overall by rear naked choke. And, of course, he is a team alpha male member. So anytime you can get an opponent's neck, whether it be a choke or a guillotine or anything like that, he has the ability to squeeze and shut that fight down. Now, looking at his takedown numbers, over his last eight defeats, he has been on the wrong end of a takedown ratio of 18 by his opponents and just three by him. So you see how crucial his takedown uh, offense is to his success. Ultimately, ultimately, I keep saying that. Either way, Faber needs to be one of two things in a fight, or a combination of both. He either needs to be the faster, more dynamic striker, which has certainly been diminishing over the last couple of years, or he needs to be the better wrestler. The combination of the two works, but he needs to have one of those two in his favor for him to be successful. He's a bit of an unorthodox striker. He likes to leap in. He has some pop in his hands, but not really a natural knockout threat. We did see him knock down Cruz a couple of times in their first UFC encounter. Now, looking at Brad Pickett, uh, he has 10 wins by submission. He's very crafty on the ground. He also has five losses by submission, so it certainly is an area of vulnerability. He's 8-4 and four in the scorecard, so a little bit more success in favor, but still against a lesser 
quality of opposition. We still see some of those struggles. He is 3-3 three and three in his last six fights to go the distance with four of those fights ending in split decision, which he is 2-2. Two and two. So he has had some trouble himself distancing his himself from his opponents in close fights. Uh, so his stats are equally as concerning. Pickett actually gets hit 1.49 times more per minute than he get, hits his opponent. Those are very difficult numbers to be successful with. But his takedown defense, solid, 60%. So that's going to be tested here against a guy in favor who I absolutely fully expect to look for have to have him look for takedowns in a fight that you know gets really fleshed out and develops into a long battle uh so looking at the numbers for Pickett he has won the takedown battle 28 to 8 over his last seven victories dating back to the WEC over his last eight defeats he has lost the takedown battle 8 to 3 so you can see how crucial to Pickett the his takedown game is and the ability to put his opponent on the mat is now Pickett yeah, he's a will he's willing to scrap he prefers offense to defense. He'll take a punch to land once on the feet. He's very effective that way. But again, it's those numbers that if he can't get his takedowns working, it's difficult for him to overcome that. He does do a good job of keeping his hands up, moves his head well. I like the way he starts low when he's throwing combinations and rises up to attack his opponent's chin with the end of his combinations. And, you know, he changes their, their defensive field of view. They're covering up the body, and all of a sudden he's coming and targeting the chin. That makes him very effective. When you look at how this fight's going to play out, Pickett needs to turn it into a brawl. He needs to absolutely scrap the heck out of, of Faber and really, you know, make this a dogfight and push him. Faber's going to have the off the offensive and defensive wrestling advantage, which is going to be essential to whoever wins this fight. And I think that's obviously on Faber's side. If Faber wants to take him down, he's going to. If he wants to stay vertical, he will. I think he's going to take him down. Faber may have lost a step or so, but I think Pickett, ha Pickett has as well. I think Uriah is going to take him down, grind out top position, land some ground and pound. Eventually, when Pickett tries to roll to get up or you know, get back to his feet, we're going to see Faber jump on his back and lock in that rear naked choke. And my prediction is Uriah Faber to defeat Brad Pickett by submission. In the co-main event of the evening, we're in the UFC's uh, welterweight division is Super Sage Northcutt, eight wins and one loss, takes on Mickey Gall with an undefeated record of three wins and no losses. Now, this is a fight that Gall called for. He got. We'll see if he bit off more than he can chew. Uh, these are also two fighters coming from that looking from a fighter series. They're going head-to-head, -head, probably the most two prominent fighters, Sage Northcutt, because of his capabilities and what he's done so far, and Mickey Gall because of who he's fought and who he's defeated so far, namely CM Punk. Northcutt is actually moving back up to welterweight for this matchup, and Mickey Gall is, should be, is moving on from CM Punk and that drawn-out legacy of when are they going to face, when is this going to happen in the, you know, clusterfuck of a fight that saw Gall dominate the former WWE superstar en route to a very one-sided submission victory now Northcutt he is coming off a pretty nice win over Enrique Marin which he was tested in he won the fight it was a nice rebound performance from his first career loss against Brian Barberina but it was anything but dominant it was very you know there were some pretty tight moments we'll talk about momentarily for Gall keep this in mind for Mickey he hasn't faced an opponent in the UFC yet who has a professional win as a mixed martial artist uh he is six foot two. Mickey Gall six two. He'll be two inches taller than Northcutt. He'll have a three inch reach advantage. Northcutt is the younger man by four years. Keep in mind that uh, Northcutt again moving back up from lightweight, where he has spent most of his time, other than his loss to Brian Barberina. Now Sage is a BJ or sorry is a uh, black belt in Taekwondo and a BJJ purple belt overall. When he's striking, he utilizes a variety of spinning attacks, quick strike, uh, quick straight combinations, very, very fast when he unloads, exceptionally quick on the feet, good footwork and distance management overall. He throws a nice left jab, solid right hand, which he hurt Barbarina with so, uh, several times, and really did some damage early on in that fight when things were going well for him in the opening round. Uh, he will look for takedowns, and he will set them up with his strikes, and once he gets on top, he's got some hard ground and pound, he'll mix in some elbows as well. Now, for Northcutt, we've seen some defensive grappling issues. It's certainly been a point of vulnerability in his UFC run. He was struggling with the clinch game of Barbarina, who kept jamming him up every time he came forward, and Enrique Marin had a lot of success putting him on the cage at times, and either holding him there or looking to set up takedowns and putting him on the mat from that position. As I said, Marin took him down from the clinch. Uh, Cody Fister had success putting uh, Sage on the mat as well, and Sage had to wait for a referee stand-up in that fight. So certainly it was not a good position early on. Going back to the Enrique Marin fight at UFC 200, Northcutt lost several of the scrambles. He did have his moments where he got on top, but he had to fend off some armbar attempts. He had to fend off some bad positions, and against a really strong, big, tough grappler, that might not have worked out for him so well. As I said, he eventually worked a top position, but again, he was on the defensive for large portions of that match. 
Uh, looking at Mickey Gall, he is a BJJ brown belt. All of his three pro UFC or pro wins have come by submission, all by rear naked choke. He has never seen the three minute mark of a pro bout, which you have to wonder. You know, this kid hasn't seen a lot of adversity. What's going to happen when he gets punched in the mouth? When a takedown or two of his gets stuffed and he's forced to make adjustments on the feet, does he have that capability? We'll find out here, potentially by Sage Norcott. Or maybe not. We'll see. Um, Mickey Gall is a very quick back take. We've seen him do that very effectively. You know, against CM Punk, where he beat him up, he probably could have beat him quicker, but he was trying to get his two seconds in the limelight, pounding and breaking him down, really toying with him before he gets the get, got the submission. He doesn't want to do that with Sage Northcutt, and I, you know, I don't think he will. He recognizes this is an entirely different breed of fighter. He's gone from one, sec, you know, scenario to the next, a former pro wrestler taking on a multi-acre in Sage Northcutt. Um, you know, Mickey Gall, not a bad striker, even though we really haven't seen a heck of a lot of his stand-up, or he hasn't really been tested on the feet either. He did drop drop uh, Mike Jackson prior to submitting him. Uh, but again, that's an area we, you know, we could he could have to rely on in this fight if he can't get Northcutt down with consistency and at least keep him down. Now, Northcutt going up to 170 pounds, the speed certainly will favor him, but the size will not. He looks like a pretty big 170-pounder. I think Gall is going to use that aggressive grappling-centric attack. Uh, that other opponents have had success with. He's going to be very committed to it, and I think that's going to be where he has, you know, his biggest moments is by attacking Sage, putting him on, on the mat, and beating him up. I think Gall's going to get him down. I think he's going to control Sage Northcutt. He's going to have some decent strikes, and eventually he's going to set up the finish again. Most likely look for him to try and work to the back position. He could try to set up an arm triangle choke or something from top position or an arm bar. But either way, my prediction is Mickey Gall to defeat Sage Northcutt by submission. Finally, moving now to the main event of the evening, it's the women's strawweight division as the number eight ranked fighter in the division, 12 gauge Paige Van Zant, seven wins and two losses, takes on the 12th ranked fighter in the division, the karate hottie Michelle Watterson, currently holding a record of 13 wins and four defeats. Now, for Paige, she picked up a big win in August over Beck Rawlings. She was a little bit rusty early on after coming up an eight month layoff with her stint on Dancing with the Stars. For Watterson, she won her debut over Angela Magana. Uh, but she has now been out of action for 17 months. And we did see uh, that last weekend several fighters, uh, Jordan Meehan, Tim Kennedy, and uh, the third one is escaping me. All of them sat out for prolonged periods of time and came back and lost fights, and the ring rust certainly showed. For Paige Van Zandt, one inch taller, three inch reach advantage, she is the younger fighter by eight years as well. And keep in mind, Watterson was a former Adam Waite fighter when she fought in Victa, actually won the title there in that division. But she is making the move up, or she has made the move up, and she has fought there before as well at 115 pounds. Now for Paige, she has two wins by knockout, including the Beck Rowling stoppage, two and one in fights ended by submission, three and one in the scorecards. Watterson, three and one in fights ended by knockout, eight and two in fights ended by submission, and two and one in the scorecards. So a much deeper record as far as numbers are concerned, favoring Watterson. But Paige has fought some high level opposition uh, during her time in the Ultimate Fighter. Um, interesting to note with Watterson, she has four straight fights that have been finished, some in her favor, some against, in the third round and, and, and beyond. One of them actually going to the fourth round before the finish transpired. So it's certainly an interesting scenario there with, uh, you know, you don't always see that. You see fighters who can finish in the opening round, maybe two, but, you know, rounds three and four. Kind of kind of a cool uh, stat there. Now, Watterson, she's a Jackson train fighter, black belt in karate. She can work from distance and strike from the outside, but she is very strong in the clinch, and that's where she does a lot of her... Uh, damage has a lot of her success now we have seen instances where she has struggled at times in that area as well she was pushed up against the cage early by Magna, Magana and she had you know against Jessica Penne as well she had some issues in that position back in Invicta fighting at 105 pounds now when she was pushed into the cage she did find success using her head to you know really fight for position and really grind out her opponent um, but she still she found herself stuck with her back on the wall for a prolonged period of time losing the position when she did get some space in her last fight, she landed an excellent throw, and that really set the tone for that matchup. She has very good balance. She looked for those headlock hip toss maneuvers. She almost got rolled on an attempt later in the fight, but she showed that good base, that good balance, stayed on top, and eventually moved to mount. Um, now, defensively, she has been, as I said, she has been submitted once in her career, and she was caught in a couple, uh, one very close arm, but I think she got caught in another one later on in that matchup. And she had to defend it. I said it was close. It was tight. She spent some time on her back, or defending it, and eventually got out. And that, you know, that's something that shows good defensive work, but at the same time, it means that you are putting yourself in a position where you can't get caught. She does have an active guard herself well, once uh, Michelle gets put on her back, and she will attack, but again, that's a position you don't want to be either. If you're not catching submissions, you're probably losing the fight in most scenarios. 
In her last fight, as I said, she worked off her back, looked for an arm bar, and eventually used that to sweep the top position. She will orchestrate her own takedowns, had a nice body lock takedown in that fight, moved to back mount, hard ground and pound, and eventually setting up the rear naked choke for the finish. At distance, when she's standing vertically and looking to strike, she has some pretty good kicking, you know, kicking attacks. She'll go to the head, she'll go to the body, she'll attack with some oblique kicks. She has a nice left jab, right hook combination that she'll work in. And again, she ultimately is looking, oh, there it is again, ultimately looking to close the gap to set up some of her clinch attacks. Now, looking at Paige Van Zandt, we're a little more familiar with her, at least in the UFC, familiar with her body of work. She works at a relentless pace, keeps pushing, works exceptionally hard in the clinch to overwhelm and exhaust her opponent. Uh, she'll throw big clinch and knee, uh, throw, sorry, big knee strikes in the clinch. She will, uh, sorry, as she says, she'll throw big clinch, uh, knees in the clinch, elbows, punches. She'll work takedowns as well. She'll also eat some big shots in that position. Felice Harry was having some success hurting her on the inside. Now look for Paige to look for those headlock takedowns, which can result in her losing position if they're not executed properly, if she goes for them out of desperation, doesn't commit to them fully. Harry had some success putting her in some bad spots when she attempted those throws. But again, Paige, very good at scrambling to a better position. Uh, she has, you know, she'll work her opponent's back. Sometimes she can lose position, again, being too aggressive. But again, she never stops working, and she can get up and work out of bad positions. She landed, she landed some nice body lock takedowns from the close. Uh, in close, does a nice job of you know passing her opponent's leg, swinging into the side, chip away with strikes. She had some issues controlling Beck Rawlings in close, and that really uh, showed up in that first round of that fight. You know, when she fought Rose, she got completely dominated, an upset pick that I picked correctly. She got busted up on the mat. She got controlled. She got out wrestled. Everything was going against her in that fight. She showed a lot of heart, and she didn't give up until it was. It, Rose had to put a heck of a lot of damage on on her to eventually get the submission victory. I believe it came in rounds four or five. I can't. I think maybe even five. So Paige really made her fight to the very end, which is something it's going to take a lot to get Paige out of there. You might have to break her arm in the early stages when she is still fresh. Um, you know, we saw her land some decent strikes in the Beck Rawlings fight. She landed some nice front kicks down the middle. She landed that jumping front kick to uh, Beck's chin that knocked her out, which was quite amazing considering we haven't really seen a heck of a lot of awesome striking out of Paige Van Zandt overall. And that's something, again... There is a secondary aspect of her attack, very similar to Michelle Waterson. Now, this fight, for my money, is going to be contested in the clinch. Who can control the position, who gets the better of the strikes and offensive attacks from the position, and who can score takedowns and wind up in the superior spot on the mat. I think the layoff for Michelle Waterson is going to be concerning, especially in a fight that could go five rounds against a high-paced, all-energy fighter like PVZ. The physicality of Paige Van Zandt is also going to be an issue. And again, Michelle, yes, yeah, she's coming up from Adam Waite. She's... You know, she's not a huge fighter at 115 pounds by any stretch of the imagination. That's something the physicality of Paige can be a lot to deal with, especially if you start slowing down after rounds two or three. Um, Paige, she's very hard to control, even if she's taken down. And I've seen Watterson have so much trouble staying vertical over opponents that are able to take her down. And I think, you know, she can attack and could catch Paige off her back. But again, if she can't do it early on, those opportunities are going to diminish as the fight progresses, both because of fatigue and because fighters get sweaty, it gets diff more difficult to lock those submissions in. I think it's going to be very close early. Waterson could even get the better of the first and second round. But I think Paige is going to get out of some tough positions. She's going to exhaust Michelle Waterson. She's going to beat her up in the clinch. She's going to get her on top, score some takedowns. She'll break her down with that top position pressure. She's going to defend some submissions off her back. But my prediction is Paige Van Zant to defeat Michelle Waterson by, I'm going to say TKO. I think she just wears her out and stomps her out. So those are my four main card predictions for UFC on Fox 22. All of my preliminary picks and my bet packs will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. So please check all of that out. Uh, obviously, this is the last fight before the Christmas uh, Christmas break, if you will. We'll see you for New Year's. Obviously, right after Christmas uh, shuts it down. I wish you and your family Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever it is you celebrate. You know, the best to all of you. As always, thank you very much for tuning in. We have one fight left in the year. I'm hoping to do a, uh, a show, an awards show, and a recap show for the year. No promises. I'd really like to take a little bit of a break to spend with my family as you uh, will with yours so we'll see what i can come up with maybe it'll have to wait to the new year because there is a bit of a break in the new year either way thank you very much as always for tuning in and uh the best to you and yours take care guys and we'll see you shortly <laughs>